everyone. Hello and welcome to this edition of the Angels and Destiny show. Why is this show called this, you may ask? So I'll tell you, the accepted meaning of angel is messenger and the accepted meaning of destiny is to make firm establish. So my guests and I bring you messages to establish what you need to know. And also I like working with angels and the calmness they bring. Now, in a moment, I will introduce you to my wonderful guest, Carol Ritchie. But before that, I'd like to say thank you so much for watching the show live at a later date, as it means a lot to me to connect with like-minded women. Now, if you've never met before, then my name is Ray, and I love to help women to crossroads in their life, heal their past, create their future, transform their present, so they can take control of their destiny in the here and now. I'm the founder of Rain and Angel Energy, and I use angelic Reiki, future life progression, past life regression, meditation, angel cards and hypnosis to help women who feel lost get clear on their destiny. Um, I've also created a transformational journey to help you. Now, each episode of the show will cover various themes of your journey, a mini guided meditation or angel card reading with the wisdom of my wonderful guests, like today's guest, Carol Ritchie, who will be sharing her journey and talking about it's a way of being. Now, Carol trained with Dr. Richard Vandler, Michael Neal, Paul McKenna, Kevin Lay, and Jersh, and many more renowned therapists and best-selling authors. She is a master practitioner in neuro-linguistic programming and hypnosis, a CITAP havening and old pain to go practitioner, which sounds really interesting, an advanced practitioner and master trainer in future life progression, a hypnobirthing teacher, and is director of a company she founded, Think Success which provides training for parents, teachers, and other professionals who work with children. She is a member of the General Hypnotherapy Register, the College of Medicine, and the Past and Future Life Society. Now, based in Essex, Carol is passionate about helping local people to reach their full potential and has developed Think Success to further use her talents as a therapist, trainer, and coach. She uses hypnotherapy and psychosensory therapy and provides training in behavior management, resilience and positivity, hypnobirthing and FLP. Now, Carol has utilized her many years of working in education and the numerous fantastic opportunities she had to train with the best in the fields of therapy, coaching, and to put together Think Success, offering bespoke therapy, coaching and training to those working with children, adults and organizations. And Carol says this, I was drawn to work with children with disabilities and soon found myself wanting so much more for these children and their families. I was never good at keeping my mouth shut and often found myself disagreeing with the view of the education establishment. I knew I needed to learn more, find answers and look for solutions. I set out to train with the best out there and I did. So without further delay, hello Carol and welcome to the Angels and Destiny show. How are you today? I'm fine. Hello, Ray. Hello, everybody else. And actually, very fine today. It's been a beautiful sunny day. Doesn't it make you feel good when it's sunny oh, like that? It, it oh. does. It's kind of like, yeah, spring's arrived. Yeah, blossom <laughs> on the trees. Oh, yeah, we like it. Yeah. So before we get into this fascinating conversation, I want to remind you that you can also ask questions, leave comments and thoughts, as both Carol and I want to be part of this conversation. So please don't be shy. We'll try to say hello to everyone who says hello and answer any questions or comments live or once the show is finished. So, Carol, why don't you tell us more about yourself, your journey, and about it's a way of being and how it can help others? Okay, thanks, Ray. Um, yeah, well, I trained as a teacher many years ago, uh, and I mostly worked with children with disabilities, some with physical disabilities, some with learning disabilities. Um, and in that field of work, you end up not just working with, with the children, but with the whole family. You know, if, if a family goes down, when you've got a child with a disability, if a family goes down, there's nobody left to look after the kids. So families are really important. But as most people realise these days, education and the way of the world, I suppose, really, in recent years, in the last probably 20 years, I think has gone more and more towards people being more and more independent and less interdependent. We've actually become quite an isolated individual society. Really. Um, and with education, um, a lot of education now is driven by data, by tick boxing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then I found this was really at odds with the way I thought about bringing up children, not just about education, but about children as a whole. They're our future, aren't they? They're the future yeah. generation. 
And I think that the way we need to be, hence the way of being, the way we need to be with children is more about them as individuals, more about their feelings, the energy of them. That's the sort of holistic look to, to children. Um, one of my favourite sayings, and, that, and people that know me work really well will probably go, oh, I know what she's going to say now, but it really, is, it really does sum up for me how I feel about families, schools, anywhere where we're bringing our future generation up. And that's this, that children don't reach their full potential if they're miserable, unhappy and uncomfortable and you don't get comfortable happy contented children in an establishment or a home full of unhappy discontented miserable adults yeah so it has to be about whether it's a home setting or a school or a children's home i do quite a lot of work with children's homes these days it has to be about that developing that way of being within that place and that can only happen if it comes from the heart if it's about your energy um, and I've had, over the years, I've had a few epiphanies, you know, as we all do, those light bulb moments. Um, and one of them um, basically sort of summed up for me how what works. But backtracking a little bit, when I worked in education, there were lots of times when I would do something, I would have a, I'm going to say, conversation with a young person, although it might just be sitting with them, you know, and stuff happening. Or it might have been me persuading them to come in from outside, come down from a climbing frame, do do what they were meant to be doing. Yeah. And people would often say to me, how do you do that? You know, because I always managed to persuade them to do what I wanted them to do. And at the time, I didn't know. I didn't know what it was that I did. And then I realised, all, all the training that I did and the sort of insights that I was getting... I realise that it's about a way of being. It's about connecting energetically with kids and about developing that connection with them. And the, and the only way I can think to describe it is about it being a way of being. Um, one of my grandchildren, uh, I've got eight grandchildren, another one's you within a month, <laughs> nine. Um, and one of my grandchildren, Harriet, she will be three in July. And when Harriet was a tiny baby... Her, she had colic, she had really bad colic. And if any mums have ever, ever had a baby with colic, it's, it's incredibly distressing for new mums when they've got this baby that often at the same time every night just screams the place down for something like an hour or something like that. Yeah. And a, a lot of doctors these days, a lot of paediatricians these days talk about it being, you know, um, it's just a crying thing, there's nothing wrong with them, you know, this sort of thing. And Har uh, Harriet had colic to the extreme. You know, she would, it, it was sort of thing to go on for longer and longer every evening and there was just nothing that could pacify her. Um, and our Victoria would phone us up sometimes and she'd be so distressed. She phoned up one evening and could hear, hear the baby crying in the back of the car. She, Victoria was in the car. And when we asked her where she was, she was miles away from her house. She's just driven round and round trying to pacify this baby. Because sometimes they can they can get caught yeah. on the car in the, in the car. So we we said just just bring her here, bring her here. Then you can either just go and sit in in the bedroom on your own, or you can go home and leave her here. And this baby was totally red in the face. She was oh, she was wringing wet with sweat. She was screaming. And I remember just kept holding her in my arms. And looking at her in her eyes, and it was just like everything. I, I sort of put myself into a trance, but connected with her so that everything else disappeared. And, the, and in, I wasn't saying a word out, out loud, but in my mind, I was connecting with her, talking to her subconscious. And, and I was sort of going through the process that we go through when we do something that's called old pain to go. And, and you sort of mentioned mm. that earlier. But I wasn't actually saying anything out loud. And when we when we do old pain to go, it's usually with an adult who's responding physically, etc. This was a tiny baby of about seven weeks old, who was whose body was actually responding to me connecting with her subconscious just through the power of thought. And that energetic collect connection is something that I realised I've done all my adult life with kids. When I've worked with kids with um, severe cerebral palsy or teenagers who are just you know who are just really really mm. untouchable you know those teenagers who who are just completely devoid of any apparent feeling etc cetera, etc cetera. 
And I've always been able to make that connection with them. Didn't know how I did it until that day with that baby. And I realised exactly what, what it was I did. And what I'd like to do, what I want to do eventually, <clears throat> is, is show as many adults as I can how to do that. As many parents. Mm. It's one of the reasons I trained as a hypnobirthing teacher. Because I thought that way I've got that input yes. from even before they're born. Because I do believe that you can start that then. I really do. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm rattling on. Have you got any questions for me, Ray? No, 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 that's, um, no, no, that, that, that's fine. Um, yeah, no, that, that's fine. So how, um, so, 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 you, so your journey, um, you know, how did that kind of like start? Okay, well, I've always been very spiritual. Um, as a kid, I saw stuff, you know, I saw spirit. I didn't realise that at the time. Um, I mean, I... I had a friend when I was really small and I lived with my, my grandparents and a couple of my aunties uh, and mum. I had a friend who I used to play with outside the front door. We lived in, we lived in, in, uh, in Bermondsey in London in a block of flats and there was a little sort of square at the front and I used to play with Nicholas at the front. And it wasn't until I was well, in my 40s that, I, that my aunt, one of my aunts, who's only about 12 years older than me, she, she, we were talking about kids and imaginary friends and she said to me, so do you think your imaginary friends was, well, friend was a spirit or a real child? And I said, what imaginary friend? She said, that, the one that you had that you used to play outside with. And I said, no, I don't remember that. And then she said something else. And I went, oh, I said, you mean Nicholas? I said, no, he wasn't imaginary. He was real. And she just looked at me. She said, Carrie wasn't there. <laughs> I, I know this little boy was there. And I actually, I think now that was my introduction to spirit. Because as a kid, when, you, when children see this stuff, they don't know that society thinks that they shouldn't do this. So they just interact with, with these beings, with these spirits, don't they? And I think that's what's yeah. happening there. And then there would be things like um, we'd, I'd be in the back of the car with mum and dad um, and I, we'd be going down the road. And this happened to us once when we were going on holiday in Cornwall. We're going along this road and I can remember getting really, really excited because I knew just around the corner was home. It's the first time we'd ever been there. You know, and I said, oh, we're nearly there. And then because we got to this house and drove past it, but I knew I'd lived there. So so all my life I've had lots of stuff go on and happen and things. When I was, uh, when I was in my 20s, um, I had a near-death experience. I had, uh, I had cancer and I had to have surgery. I was only 28. I had three little kids. And um, when I had the last operation... As I, was, as I was recovering in the recovery room, um, I can remember this lady. I couldn't hear her, but I could see her saying my name. Her face was sort of close to me. Mm -hmm. And I knew that her hand was tucking my face because I could see it. But I couldn't feel it. The only thing I could feel was a hand on my forehead. Yeah. Like that. And she, uh, everything was sort of going sort of, a, you know, more and more white. And what she was saying, I could, I could hear her a bit and see, see she was saying, we're losing her, we're losing her. Um, and at that point, I remember thinking, I'm not going anywhere yet. I'm not ready yet. Um, I, I, I want to see my kids grow up. Yeah. And then drifted off again. And the next time I woke up, I still had this feeling here, like a hand on my forehead and, and a hand in my hand. Mm. And I remember laying in, in, in this hospital bed and looking up to see who this was standing behind me with their hand on my forehead. And all there was was the back of the bed, you know, and knobs and things on the wall, that sort of thing. And then I looked down at my hand to see whose hand I was holding and there was nobody there. But, but I could still feel this warm hand. And as I, I could feel, the squeeze, see it, feel it squeezing my hand. And from that point on, I thought, this is real. You know, this is... This isn't something that, you know, I'm not going, I'm not going a bit bad. This isn't something abnormal. This is something I need to take notice of. And by coincidence, well, we all know there's no such thing as coincidences. There was a there were two ladies on the same ward as me that time I was in hospital, who were both mediums. And over the course of that week, I had to stay in hospital for a whole week after that. And during the course of that week, they chatted to me and they made they sort of made everything feel like it made sense, all the things yeah. that I, I'd experienced. 
So from that point on, instead of sort of pushing spirit, spirit away and pushing things like that away, I embraced it. And I'm, I'm absolutely convinced now that that's what made the biggest difference to the yeah. way I was with, school, with kids, with work and that sort of thing. The, the other thing that I, I often think about now and the thing that I wonder how much difference it's made. After I trained with Anne Josh and trained in FLP, and as you said, I'm everyone, you know, FLP trainer now as well, I made a connection with my dis, a distant future self. So I went into the distant future mm. and met me in a distant future life who was so wise and just full of brightness and light. I mean, it's just like pure energy. And it's almost like meeting a version of yourself that's all-knowing, you know, that knows everything. And they definitely know everything about you. Yeah. And made this connection so that, and, and, and I can remember that future version of me saying, I'll always be here for you. I'm here to, I'm here to help you, you know. Um, and it was like after that, some of the things that in my past were a bit scary, like when I, when I knew I had cancer, I... I, I, I remember being really, you know, I must have been really, really scared. I must have thought I was going to die because I remember I made a tape for my kids so they'd always have my voice. Okay. But when I think of it now, it's like all of the bad feeling and all of the trauma is gone. So I, I don't know whether that's my future self making everything feel better. I don't, I don't know. And the same as the things where in my past, in the life, where things have just happened to help me, you know, like the right people being there at the right time for me to train with, to teach me things. Now, you know, how much of that was just, you know, sheer luck or how much was it somebody in, you know, you know, whether we call it up there, out there, in the future, somebody making these things happen. And and even now, if, if I'm working with children, uh, there's times when, you know, I've got a, a child with me and it's like there's somebody else just moving things around just to make it happen. Yeah. Yeah, oh, that's 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 so, that's so beautiful. Um, you know the, the the fact that it's um, uh, you, you know to I mean I mean do the children um, know that there's somebody else there as well or are, are they aware so. of that? Yeah, I I think so. A lot of children. I mean, I know with um, a couple of my grandchildren who you know they'll talk to me about you know, what they can see and things like that, and talk to me about their previous lives. Like, you know, one of my grandsons often talks about when I, when I, when my kid, when I had my kids, when I, when I had a job, that when he, obviously, yeah. and it's the only explanation of his life. But also, um, I think the, the other thing that uh, I can remember happening a lot, especially when I worked with kids with severe learning disabilities, often they would come to me in my dreams and, they would tell me things that they couldn't tell me in their waking yeah. life, but would really help with that connection with them. Um, for instance, one, there was one young lady who um, I'm still in touch with her now. She's about 38 now. She has severe cerebral palsy. And um, she was born, there was a, another, another young lady who was born, uh, a day, they were born a day apart. Um, they were born a day apart. They both ended up with severe brain damage, severe cerebral palsy in the same hospital. So their mums became quite good friends and they grew up together. They didn't live that near to each other, but yeah. obviously they started school on the same day. They went all through school together. And because they were both quite severely affected by their disabilities, everything that, that was, out, was right for, for one of them to do, curriculum-wise, it was also right for the other. And um, I'm, I'd known them for a long time. And when they were about 11, I was their class teacher. Um, and I used to plan for them to do everything together, like everybody had done. And in fact, most people in those days, I feel quite bad about it now, instead of calling them by their names, we referred to them as the girls. So, because most special schools, mostly boys. And I had sort of these three distinct groups of kids uh, mm. in the class. And I had two learning support assistants that worked with me. So we split them into their sort of ability groups when they when they did that sort of thing. And these two young ladies, both with severe cerebral palsy, would go off and work together. And one night I dreamt that one of them um, 
her name's Natalie. Um, and I say, our class was a friend now. Um, I dreamt that all of a sudden she was okay. And in my dream, she got out of her wheelchair. She stood up, which she couldn't do. She started to speak, which she couldn't do. And uh, she was chatting to me. And I, I was like, oh, wow, this is amazing. You know, it's re uh, this, is, this is fantastic. And the other young lady was nearby in her wheelchair, still uh, affected and laughing, you know. And, and I remember this other young lady, when she laughed a lot, she, she would cough, but she's in the background laughing and coughing. And I said, so I said, tell me, Natalie, so what, tell me, what was the worst thing about being the way you were? Now that you can talk and you can walk and everything, what was the worst thing about being severely disabled, like disabled like, like you were? And I remember, and it was so funny because the, her voice, I can remember that voice now. And obviously, in reality, she, she didn't have a voice. And she said to me, honestly, Carol, you want me to tell you the truth? And I said, yeah, please. She said, the worst thing about being disabled where I was was being stuck with her my whole life. It's Abigail. <laughs> she said, being stuck with her my whole life. She said, seriously, if I go swimming, she goes swimming. If you get me out of my chair and lay me down on the sensory mat, there she is next to me. I cannot get rid of her. And, this other, and in my dream, this other young lady was cracking up laughing so the next morning I went into, into work and when it you know we did the whole sort of beginning bit of the, the lessons and then when it was time for them to split into their groups I said to my assistants change slight change about plan we're going to do things a bit differently today um, I'm going to split the girls up and you're going to work with them separately and they said to me are we right why and I went just just bear with me because this is what we do and I said oh, I'm going to take Natalie off and have a word with her and I remember taking her to one side, just the two of us. And I looked in, I remember looking into her eyes and I said, I had a dream about you last night. And I swear this child, her eyes lit up and she had a half smile on her face. And I just, there is something in me that just knows that that, ch that child knew about that. And I think sometimes they would come, I think yeah. children like that, they'll come to you in your dreams to let you know what it is that they need. Yeah. So I think that's that's probably always helped in in what, what I do. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it is kind of like us giving more. Um, in in you know that yeah you know knowing that these these children actually have a lot more than 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 we perceive. Oh yeah, it's absolutely. It's, it's like yeah. we you know it's just that human side of us, isn't it? We we see something, we label it, we mm. think that's what it is, and we and we don't tend to look deeper inside yeah uh, absolutely to see, yeah. To see the true to the true essence yeah um, it. it's, the same, it's the same when we see clients i mean you must have had this right you you know you have, we, we often see clients that are really troubled don't we and and they come to see you and for, for as far as the rest of the world is concerned these people you know they have mental health issues or they're depressed and, they, and they've got all these labels that actually makes them in some respects treated as not quite as human as other people and then when we meet them we make that connection with them and we see the real as you say the real yeah. essence of uh, yeah yeah which, which you know hopefully um people more and more people are starting are starting to do now so you kind of like said you had issues with the educational establishment what mm. kind of like issues were there it was all about this sort of mechanical um non-personal way that we're going with education um i remember or oh, going back quite a few years before i i because i took early retirement from from education to do what i do now um but i remember a few years before that uh being in a room with a couple of other head teachers and uh somebody from the local authority from the education authority and this, this, I mean, I felt quite sorry, sorry for this lady from the Education Authority afterwards because I did give her a bit of a hard, a hard time. And she was just saying what she had to say, you know. She was, they wanted to roll out this computer programme that um, recorded and analysed pupil progress. And what they were saying was um, year on year, all of the children in our special schools, you know, each year group had to make more progress than the average a year before when you when you think about it you know if you average out the progress that a group of children make with special needs and then say okay next year 
the next year group have got to make more progress than them. And then, the, well, actually, it'd be lovely if it did work that way because we wouldn't have any need for special schools. Yeah, exactly. But, <laughs> but and, and all it was about was was the data and, you know, and basically just treating these groups of children as groups for a start, not individuals. Yeah. And look at them as, you know, they've got to tick these boxes. Um, and especially now, it seems to have gone even further now when you're looking yeah. at, you know, um, a lot of the schools that I do work with. I'm, I mean, I'm really lucky. The schools that want to want me to go in and do training with them, you know, when they want me to do resilience and positivity training, you know, and, and when it's behaviour management training, I'm talking to them about the way they need to be, about that way of being. But the sad thing is the schools that engage my services and want me to go and train them are the ones that sort of half get it anyway. Yeah. The ones that don't, you know, that really don't want anything, you know, the ones that don't know what they don't know, you're never going to get them. Um, and there's more and more people that are they're running schools like businesses. They're yeah. running... Um, I mean, one of the one of the work I, so I had that run in with that poor lady who I ended up shouting at. Yeah, you know, I don't often shout. I don't really shout at children, but I shouted at her big time. Um, but I remember another time when um, we had uh, a, another discussion with somebody that was to do with finance who referred to the school budget as profit and loss. <laughs> I think I lost it a bit at that point. Yeah, quite <laughs> that one. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I can remember having lots of discussions and sort of, you know, quite heated discussions with people because um, what I was saying about the fact that you don't get happy, contented, comfortable children with unhappy, discontented, miserable adults, you yeah? know? Yeah. And, and then you come across an establishment or, you know, um, a hierarchy where there's no thought to the people that work there. Um, one of the things that I remember... Um, being really, um, you know, passionate about was the fact that anybody that worked for me, if their children were ill, they needed to be home with them. Yeah. You know, if they if it was their child's first day at school, if it was, you know, if it was if they were doing some their first special assembly, something like that, they sh that one of their parents needed to be there, and I felt quite strongly about that. I mean, I remember. Um, there was one lady that worked for me whose whose mum had quite severe um, Alzheimer's, and she was in the local care home just down the road for, from our school, and she wouldn't eat. This lady's mum just wouldn't eat unless her daughter was there to feed her. So I gave her a longer lunch break every day to go down to the, the care home yeah. to feed her mum. And I remember this lady looking at me and saying to me, "You you would you would do that?" And I said, "Yeah, why wouldn't I?" She said. Why, you know, she other people, and I said to her, Well, don't get me wrong, I said it's purely selfish. I said, Because I know that if you are happy, if your mum's happy and eating, you're happy, and then you'll come back in this school and the children will be happy. Yeah, yeah. so it's not, not about being a goody two shoes, but people don't get that that's how you get, and it's not just schools, is it? You no, know, companies don't, yeah, and and this is, and the only way I could think to describe the whole ethos of this was to call it a way of being because everybody has to be engaged in that way of being with each other as well. It has to be about being there for the right reasons, knowing why you're there and being there for the right reasons. And when it comes to families, you know, when I work with mums with their babies or children, quite often you can see there's just huge amounts of stress between them in the family dynamics between yeah. mum and baby. And that way of being is about that intense connection, you know, and, and you, you do see it, you know, you, if you think back to, we've all experienced, I, I think, where you've seen a, a mum with, with a new baby and they're staring into each other's eyes. Yes. And you see it then, you see that then, but we often quickly lose it once the pressures of life have, you know, bearing down on us. Or when you get sort of the dynamics with this, the first time the children try, try to test you out and things like yeah. that, when you get that stress. So it's about how to keep, how to regain that or keep it. I think that's the best way of describing it. Yeah, yeah. We've had um, a couple of people. Um, Trudy Foster um, said, um, obviously that was when we were talking about those two girls. Well, that's amazing. How lovely for those girls. 
<laughs> yeah. and, you know, the fact you're still friend, you know friends with one of them is yeah. is, is, yeah. is absolutely amazing and the other, one, the other one's passed away now but i know oh, she's yeah. there. Yeah. Oh. And, I, and she's probably still hanging around with natalie you know? exactly it's like <laughs> yeah. you couldn't get rid of me in life but you ain't getting rid of me now that's it yeah <laughs> and jane says hi ladies very interesting to hear about the girls I've always connected with most disabled people I've met. It's great to see beyond the normal perception. And I felt they should be included long before it was PC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's absolutely a um, brilliant yeah. thing. And and it is, you, you know, and it's and it's, you know, not just people with disabilities, it's everybody you meet, every single person yeah. is is literally um, you know, seeing beyond what 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 you see in front of you. It's literally looking deep inside and connecting with with their higher self absolutely yeah. with them because everyone's perfect yes um yeah. it's, it's yeah. just that sometimes we we don't look or we don't act it because mm -hmm. that's just how society and we've chosen to come that's it yeah we're born perfect exactly we're, yeah we're born perfect we're, we're born perfect we're born innocent and we're, we're born good kind yeah. You know, we're born nice. It's all the other stuff that goes on afterwards, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. That that kind of like throws throws, throws everything in, into the mix. Yeah. Um, so, so so do you so do you just go into um, schools or do you work one to one with with people? Yeah, both. So I, I, in fact, I've got um, I was contacted by a young lady this week who I'm going to be seeing her and her son together um her son has been he's actually been traumatized by her trying to take him to the hairdressers um it can be a really disturbing experience going to the hairdresser unless it's done right so things like that you sort of go got to go back to the beginning and sort of almost reprogram that poor little mic to you know to enjoy having his hair cut that sort of thing um, so, yeah, one-to-one. -one. And I also, as I say, I do training for people that work with children, children, children's homes. And, and I've done a few care homes as well for people that work with the elderly because there's a lot of correlation there, isn't there, yeah, between children and children. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, schools, mostly primary schools, very, very few secondary schools. Um, it's hard to get them to see that there's a need there, I think. Mm. Um, although I've got some friends who have done some sort of similar work in secondary schools. But yeah, pr primary schools, um, people that work in children's homes, people that work in care homes for um, children and young adults with learning disabilities. Um, and, we, and the training is um, centred around either behaviour, communication uh, and resilience and positivity. And, and when I do that, I concentrate a lot on the staff's resilience and positivity and their language that they use. One of the things that staff often really like is when I teach them how to be more persuasive yeah. um, and teach them how to how to talk somebody into doing what they want them to do because that's the, that's the conflict, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and, and parent training as well. I, I, every now and again I put on a parent training course um, and often the parents that come along to that get a, get a lot out of it, you know, um, you see the light bulb moments. You know, I remember yeah. doing a, a course, and there was a, um, and this is this is quite typical, sadly, where you get a, you know a large group of mums and nans, and then you've got this one guy sat at the front with his wife, you know, looking, oh, what am I doing here? Um, and I remember doing a course, and there was a young couple sat at the front, and all of a sudden they looked at each other, and they both said to each other, "We do that." You know, there was this light bulb moment. Yeah. That actually, you know. Uh, and and in the beginning, they'd said um, that one of the biggest problems with their little one was that he didn't listen. And, uh, and by the time they left, they came over and said to me, "We've just realised we're not hearing him. We're not we're not listening to him." So, and uh, but it's it's about that understanding of, sort of what it is that's going on in here. And one of the things that I always say to people when I'm talking about listening to children. I always tell any of my trainees that come on the courses, I tell them from now on, when you listen to children, you're going to listen to them Chinese style. Actually, probably, you know, with the coronavirus. Perhaps <laughs> probably, yeah. But, yeah I'm, not picking, I'm not picking on Chinese. But if you look at the symbols that make up 
the words listen. So when we write listen in English, we write one word, listen. Yes. If you look at the symbol for uh, listen in Chinese, it's made up of several symbols because Chinese isn't phonetic. They don't write the sounds of words the way we do. Each symbol has a meaning to make up the word. And listen is made up of the symbol for eye, symbol for ear, symbol for mouth, symbol for heart, and then there's also the symbol for king, because if you're listening to somebody, they are the most important person. And there's also the symbol for ten. That's right next to the symbol for eye, because you should be watching them as though you've got ten sets of eyes. So I always say to people, when you're listening to children, you should be listening to them Chinese style. With your yeah. heart, with your heart, with ten eyes, and they're the most important person, which means turning the phone off, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's that's the big, that's that's the big thing. Um, yeah. it's, it's it's the phone. And on the watch party, we've had several people watching, and um, Anne was has been, um, has been watching on the watch party, and she said hello to both of us. Hi there. <laughs> hello. So so we can say that. See, that's the beauty of this. We've got the show um going on here live on facebook but we've also got a live watch party going on brilliant. facebook it's like Mom, isn't it i know it's brilliant yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, so um as you know um i do um uh, guide meditations and angel cards and each week i do like to ask my guests what they would like so carol would you like me to pull an angel card for you and those watching or would you like me to do a guided meditation could you pull an angel card for us? Okay. I don't. Do you know? It's like I don't know why. I, why I ask because everyone always wants the angel cards, and I always love doing the angel cards as well. So I know. So just cleanse and bless the cards. Mm -hmm. Now, when I uh, um, do the cards, I, I I read them for what you need to know for your highest good at this moment in time, because although I work with the past. We work with the past to heal yourself so you can be fully in the present. And I work with the future. We look at the future so that you can be fully present in the present. Mm. So, so everything is for us. So um, what does Carol and everyone who's watching this need to know for their highest good at this moment in time? Whoa. Okay. Chosen for you. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to love this. Joy and delight. Open your heart to joy. Oh, <laughs> and how perfect is that for what it's we've lovely. actually just been to, for what we've actually been to, been yeah. talking about? And this happens every week. Um, it's kind of like the the the, the cards um, jump out. So so it's really like confirmation for yourself and for all those watching. You know, look at the look at the world with joy and delight, and you know, keep your heart open. Yeah, um, and look at other people's hearts um, mm -hmm. and see their hearts open, and yeah, you know absolutely. things will just run so much smoother and be more happier and joyful, mm -hmm. um, and and there won't be any worries or cares. Yeah, in in the world. Absolutely. Yeah, and that. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. So 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 yeah, your information you. you're doing exactly the right thing that you should be doing. That's fantastic. So, <laughs> so, so that's that's pretty cool. So, Carol, before we um, wrap up, do you have any thoughts or insights that you want to leave our viewers? Yeah, I would say, and it's quite quite apt actually, having picked that card, Joy. I would say, if if nothing else, especially when you're engaging with whether it's your children, your grandchildren, if you, and especially if you work with children. Look inside them, look deep within them and make that connection. Because if you shut out everything else and you just look at that one little child, that one new, one being, you know, new being, and make that connection, you can really feel what they feel. And, and I, I, you know, I've worked with so many kids, especially teenagers, who are those ones where everybody says, you know, oh, they, you know, they won't learn, they don't do this. They don't. And when you really look inside their heart, they're just crying out for help, crying out. You know, I've, I've sat with teenagers who have spent the first 20 minutes of our conversation telling me how horrible everybody is, how they hate this person. And when you really listen, like the Chinese listening, what you hear is I'm scared. So if yeah. you look, at, if you're with a child and you really look at them and look into their heart and listen with your heart, you hear something completely different. 
Yeah, beautiful, beautiful words. Thank you, thank you for that, um, Carol. So I hope everyone that you've enjoyed this and found it insightful. In the words of wisdom, um, Carol has uh, given you will help you further on your journey. So people, if um, so people, so Carol, if people want to connect with you, how do they do that? Um, they can either find me on Facebook. Um, I've got a, a, a business page just called Carol Ritchie, or they can find me personally, Carol Clift Ritchie. Clift was was my uh, my major name. So, and people usually remember that Carol Clift Ritchie. Yeah, um, oh, or, that might be. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got a website uh, which again is carolritchie.co.uk. Um, so any any of those, yeah, I probably Facebook is about the easiest one, I think, these days. So just remember Carol Clift Ritchie and your yeah. find. Excellent. And I'll and I'll put those details in, in the comments anyway. Thank you. Uh, and that. So everyone, I want to thank you so much for watching and I'd like to invite you to share this video as I'm sure there are more women who feel lost and want to get clear on their destiny just like you. And if you have reached that crossroads in your life and you need help finding your destiny and getting clear on your path then I would love to be that guide for you. Reach out and connect with me so we can arrange a free 20 to 30 minute session via Skype or Messenger to find out more about each other and how I can help you take charge of your destiny. Um, now, as you may be, some of you may be aware, I am gonna be starting an online membership site um, in the near future. Um, so we're just getting that up and running at the moment. And on the, the 4th, 5th and 6th and 7th of uh, September, I'm going to be running a four-day uh, retreat down in Glastonbury called Take Charge of Your Destiny, um, where we'll be connecting with St. Germain, uh, Mary Magdalene, um, looking into your past, your future, any hidden gifts you, you've got. Um, quite a full uh, uh, three day, uh, four days, but with lots of free time as well to explore Glastonbury, which I know pretty well, so I can always show you around and point you in the right direction. Um, so please do contact me if you want my details on either of those. Um, and I think, Carol, you're going to be um, running a Future Life Practitioners training soon, aren't you? Yes, I am. Um, and it's, uh, <coughs> I'm trying to remember the dates now. So it's the, the last week of March. <coughs> Excuse yeah. me. Um, so it's three, a three-day FLP practitioner course. And then the fourth day is going to be anybody that wants to do a one-day standalone course for me that is specifically about working in the way I've been talking about with children. Yeah, so so, so please do check check that out. And if you can't do March, then in June, um, I'm running, I'm, I'm doing a, a Future Life Progression Practitioner Training as well. Um, I know Anne is doing one as well. So there's plenty of opportunity this yeah. year that if you want to start playing about with, with the future, um, you know, there's lots of training that's taking place. So do please contact any of us to find out more about it. Um, I look forward to um, to everyone joining me next Monday at 8 p.m. where, with fingers crossed, technology will be working this time. Uh, Lorraine Flaherty will actually be my guest, and we will go and we will be there with the, with the show. So um, yeah, Monday the 9th, please do tune in. And and Jane said uh, before we go. Thank you, ladies. Thank you so much, Jane, for watching and joining in the conversation. And to everyone who's been watching on the um, watch party, thank you as well for watching on there. So um, just leaves to, um, for us to say goodbye to everyone and we will see you all soon. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.